happens because of your function call after it, fin it returns. So uh, just taking a look at, uh, say, array.foreach, for example, is a, you give it a callback, and the uh, for each contract is that it will do all of its work by calling that callback before it returns. Whereas uh, later I'll show you promises in a promise or in, a, in an asynchronous callback, uh, you, the, the function will return before it calls your callback. So there's a pretty well-known koan in functional programming. Um, a koan is a sort of parable that has a paradox inside of it. And the idea behind a koan is to teach a student that logic is the beginning of wisdom, not the end. And the, the functional, the functional uh, koan goes like this. The, the student goes to the master and is, says, I have heard about objects and object-oriented programming, and I have studied it, and I feel that uh, I have become enlightened. I now know that everything can be modeled as objects. And the master says to him, poor fool, no, no, no. Uh, objects are a poor man's closure. And okay, so the student goes off and goes back to his, his cubby and studies everything he can about functional programming. And he uh, then comes back to the master and says, ah, yes, I have I have learned, Master. I now know that, uh, that you can do everything with closures. And the, the Master turns to him and says, Ah, no, no, no. Closures are a poor man's object. Um, and then he goes off and becomes enlightened. Um, so the way I figure it, there's this three-step process to enlightenment. It starts with one, what even is? And then two, uh, everything is, and then three is like, oh, okay, I'll just use the right tool for the job. Trade-offs are hard. Um, <laughs> so when I, when I, so I see this slide, is, uh, the, the everything is a stream. It looks to me more like this, and my hope is that this is just step two, um, because yes, obviously, you can put anything in an array. You could do everything you want to do with values by putting them in an array and then having functions and methods on arrays that do all of the things that you want to do while interacting with these arrays with one value in them. But that would be silly most of the time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about arrays. And a lot of stuff that's coming in ES6 is going, I'm going to use a lot of uh, code that you will, that, that uses syntax that's coming in the, what's now known as ECMAScript 2015, now that it's a, an official standard. Um, you can use it in IOJS, which is now known simply as Node.js, and you can use it in some, uh, in evergreen browsers. Uh, the Chrome has parts, bits and pieces of the ES6 feature set, for example. Um, I think Edge does too. So, Space and time, I've talked to you about sync and async. I've talked to you about things that are singular and some that are plural, like a value is singular and an array is a plural of values. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, into the crossing these dimensions over, and plurality and asynchrony and singularity and, and asynchrony as well. So there are more dimensions to this problem. When, once you get past the simple value concept uh, and once you get out of space and into time, things get a little bit more complicated because you have all of these other dimensions. You can have a single consumer or multiple consumers. And if you have multiple consumers, there are two different kinds of things where you can have like a unicast primitive or a, or a multicast or broadcast primi primitive. And the differences here are the relationship between the, the, the producer and the consumers. Is, like, is it an exclusive relationship? Or uh, does, and if it's an exclusive relationship, you can have things like cancelability because uh, on the other hand, if you had multiple consumers in a single producer, if one of them were to cancel, it could potentially interfere with the others. And then there are different, there's differences between do you want every consumer to see every value from the producer or do you want them to see non-overlapping uh, non regions of, of the produced values. But ultimately, the biggest problem and the, bi the, the, the big differentiator that will help you choose which primitive to use for the job is what do you do when you have a fast producer and a slow consumer? 
So there are three approaches. There are three approaches to dealing with fast producers and slow consumers. You can use push, pull, or pressure. In the push case, you have something like an event emitter that is producing a new value periodically. Um, at some interval or whenever new information is obtained or whatever like that. And it's going to con it is going to produce that value at the time that it produces it, regardless of, of the, the pace of the consumer. And this is an appropriate primitive if dropping values is an acceptable solution to having a fast producer. So if you have, if you're modeling a time series of, say, estimated time to completion or an ETA or something like that, uh, it models a value that's steady over time, and you're only interested in the most recently emitted value. So if you lose some, it's not important. It's just going to reduce the fidelity of your experience. Whereas on the other side, if you are modeling something like a progress bar, where uh, it needs to be updated every single animation frame, um, or at, at whatever speed the consumer can consume that value, you need a pull primitive in that case. And the reason why you can't use a push primitive is that because the value is continuously changing. It does not make sense to model this in a push case because it's constantly changing. For example, the current time is constantly changing. For example, the progress value is constantly changing between, one, uh, between 0 and 100 um, percent. Interestingly, progress is a function of the estimated time to completion and when you started observing it. And so you can, can, you can move these things around and coerce them into each other uh, using various strategies. The most interesting, when appropriate, is the case where you have a producer that is producing a stream of values and the consumer must see every value from that stream and in order. In that case, you want to have something called pressure where the consumer can say, I can't consume this fast enough, as fast as you're producing them, please slow down. And when you have a situation like that, you're, uh, you have, again, this, uh, this close relationship between your producer and consumer where information is flowing in both directions. The, the producer has to slow down for the consumer. The end game for this is a primitive like a stream. I'm going to propose for you that this is what streams should look like in JavaScript. Uh, a stream is an object that can be lifted up from its synchronous primitives. You can create a stream from an array or an iterable of indefinite length even. Um, and it'll have a lot of the same methods as an array, except instead of being concerned about space and being synchronous, they're going to be concerned about time and they're going to be asynchronous. So basically taking your, your spatial and tilting it up into your temporal. And we're going to use the promises for singular values and streams for plurals. Uh, the array's map function, for example, is going to return another stream. Its reduce function is going to return a promise for the ultimate value. And uh, the for each function, which before was synchronous and returned undefined when it was done, it's going to now return a promise, again, for undefined when it's done. In order to work our way up to that, I'm going to start at the bottom, though. This is a value. A value is the most primitive thing. It is a singular and it is spatial. It, has, it breaks down into two parts and these two parts are duals and you're going to see duals at every layer of this design. Uh, it'll have, in, in this case, you have a getter and a setter. So uh, what a dual is in general is a, it's a type where uh, there are a pair of types where if you take the uh, argument type of one side uh, and the return type of, on the other and flip them, you get its dual. So in this case, you see get and set are duals of each other because set accepts a value and returns an undefined, whereas get accepts undefined and returns a value. So there's this bidirectionality to them, and, uh, or they're a mirror image of each other. The important thing, though, is it also has this, uh, this uh, concept of unidirectional data flow. You, get, you can put a value in the set function, and you can get a value out of the getter, and the data flows only in that direction. And this becomes important for the robustness of more complicated programs. And then if we take our value and then move out into the plural dimension, in space, we get collections. 
And we know about, what we know about collections is that there's a wide variety of ways to store things in space. There are a whole bunch of different kinds of collections. Something that they have in common usually is that they are iterable and generatable. So your iterator and generator become your spatial versions of your getter and setter. Instead of just getting one value, you can, uh, you can obtain multiple values lazily from that collection. And then on the generator side, you can put values into the collection um, as, as you obtain them. So let's take a look at the iterator side. The iterator's on the getter side. It's the consumer side of your collection. Um, and like I said, it's going to be the first part of a dual. Um, the next method on an iterator in the next version of JavaScript, as coming out right now, uh, implements a method next uh, that returns iteration objects. And those iteration objects can do two things. One, they carry a value. And they also tell you whether the thing has completed. And that, com that, uh, that aspect that these things can be completed makes them concatenatable. You can take two iterations and concatenate them. It'll exhaust one to completion and then exhaust the other to completion. So it's important to have that, that signal. An iterator is synchronous and it's pull. So in all of those situations where you're willing to implement, to model a time series where it is, uh, where the consumer dictates the pace, those, dis those continuous variables like time and progress, an iterator is, uh, it is, an iterator is appropriate, especially if it has a conclusion event. Without that, you can boil it down to just a whole bunch of functions that call each other and, and just get a single value every time you call it but that, that the, the completion value makes them composable like collections. Uh, generator is the opposite side, and you'll notice that instead of having a next method which, which returns an iteration object, now we have methods that create iteration objects, and one, one for each of the cases. The next method adds a value to the collection. The return method concludes the collection, and the throw method concludes it uh, in, an, uh, in an aberrant case. And these, the, each of these would create an iteration object conceptually. The next method creates an iteration object with a value and done is false. The return uh, method creates an iteration with done is true and a value, optionally. And the throw throws an exception into the, into the, into the uh, collection. You can create a, you can pair these things in different ways. Uh, one way is to create a generator, a generator and an observer. With a generator and observer, what happens when you, uh, when you call one of these methods on the generator, next or return or throw, is it's going to, on the stack, synchronously call into the observer side. Anybody who is observing this value is going to be called synchronously on the stack with one of its handlers, like the on next handler, the on, on return or on throw handler, uh, receiving the value from that iteration. Um, and observers can be composed in a lot of the same ways as arrays and can have a lot of the same methods of, as arrays. So push versus pull. Suppose that you have two time series values. My canonical examples are progress versus estimated time to completion. On the push side, an observer is appropriate. The push side, where you have a discrete time series, something that changes intermittently and at discrete points in time. Uh, is, so estimated time com to completion is going to be a value like in two minutes, uh, in two, uh, at, the, at the time, two o'clock uh, and 30 minutes. An absolute time, something that doesn't change, that isn't relative to the current time. Um, observers come to us mostly via uh, the work of Eric Meyer, who's done quite a bit of this and uh, provided the insight of duality for this talk. Um, whereas pull uses something sim similar to an iterator, uh, it is for continuous data, stuff that's always changing, uh, stuff that needs to be sampled at the rate that the consumer is interested, stuff where if you aren't observing a value at any particular time, it doesn't matter. You'll get the next one whenever you call for it. Um, and uh, it'll be something like 50%, which is relative to the current time. It'll be a different value at a different time. And this comes from the functional reactive programming world, which is the purview of Conal Elliott. And Conal went on to, to talk about more sophisticated things like a combination of push and pull uh, for FRP for performance reasons, which also gives you a little bit of a hint of this insight that there isn't just one tool for the job. There's a combination. There are trade-offs. Uh, use what's appropriate for your situation. Um, 
so a generator function is this, uh, has they, these things have been around in Python for quite some time. Uh, formed slightly differently, they would throw exceptions for that stop iteration case instead of having an iteration object that captures both the, the done and value. Uh, so generator functions are just like, uh, you, you have that same exact iterator you had before where you can take the, you, it creates, it, each time when you call a function it creates an iterator instead of returning a value and then when you call next on that you're going to obtain values from the producer at the pace that you're interested in them. And then on the, uh, on the producer side, it's going to be modeled as a function that continues whenever you call next or one of these other methods. So you'll start out at the beginning of a function. In this case, I'm going to build up from using an array. So suppose that you have a range function. The purpose of the range function is to give you an array, in this case, of values from some start index to a final index exclusive. With, uh, with some step or stride or interval between them. Um, in this case, it's imp we're implementing it as uh, we, we create a result array and then we iterate from the start index to the stop index, pushing those values onto the array, incrementing, and then when it's done, we return the result. Consider the same exact function, except in the generator case, we are introducing a little bit more syntax, which I've put in bold. There's a star on the end of function, which changes it into a generator function. Um, and it has a yield keyword, which is, the, is, which is the point at which this thing will pause between, uh, between calls to next from the consumer. So this program's program counter starts off at the top of the loop uh, and, uh, and does nothing. So you call this function range and it does nothing. The no, the function does not execute at all. And there's a difference between this decision and, and continuing immediately, which is captured in the notion of evenness and oddness. Um, I don't remember which is which, but this is only one of them. <laughs> and the, the trick is that when you call next the first time, it proceeds from the beginning of the function until it hits yield and then gives you an iteration that captures that value and done is false. And if it gets all the way to the end of the function or if it hits a return, it gives you an iteration with the, uh, with the value of the return and uh, done is equal to true. In this case, I'm just going to capture the value zero, I'm gonna capture the two, and then it'll conclude with done. So, that shows you everything that I, uh, th everything that you use, that we're going to use as a model for this analogy into time coming from space. The first primitive, asynchronous primitive I want to talk about is a promise. So a promise has this exact same uh, duality that we saw on values and collections. In, the, in this case, it breaks up into a resolver and a promise. The deferred is the, is, the, is the word I'm choosing to use to capture both of these. A deferred breaks down into a promise and a resolver. The resolver is the producer side and you give the promise to the consumer side. So with the consumer, you get to observe the eventual, uh, the eventual result of some function and that function may, uh, that, that eventual result may be uh, a value, like a return value, or it may be like an error in a thrown error. Um, so on the, and on, a, on the producer side, we have a function, an object that has a return function and a throw function that we're going to use to set the conclusion for this promise. And you can only do so once, just like you can only return once from a function. Um, and then on the, on the uh, consumer side, it's going to be a, multi, uh, a, a broadcast uh, feature where anybody who observes is going to be able to take that value off. And promises have this, in, in, uh, important, pr uh, this important pr uh, feature of the information flow going only in one direction. Your resolver produces a value and puts it on the consumer. No information flows in the opposite direction. And of course, there are variations on this if you want that unicast behavior, that personal relationship between your producer and consumer, where then you can cancel. And there are a variety of ways of doing that, and we're still talking about what that means for JavaScript. Um, so promises in a nutshell. The most important method on a promise is the then method. The then method allows you to take a promise and create a new promise for further work. So suppose that you get to a point like you have the user's name, but you don't know what their password hash is. Um, in order to, to compute whether they can log in, you need to have both. Um, you, don't have the, you don't have the hash in hand, so you'll return a promise for the, the, the conclusion that you're responsible for using another promise as, uh, that you're going to wait for. 
The way this works is with the then method. The then method is that primitive. You get an input promise and an output promise. The then method allows you to observe the success case of the input promise or the error case of the, in, uh, of the input promise or, or some combination of both. And they have reasonable default behaviors on both sides if you, if you omit one. Like if you have error, if you omit an error handler, it's going to propagate just the way, in the same way that if you omit a try catch around a function that throws an exception, it's just going to propagate into your calling context. And the same way, same for value, if you're not interested in observing the value and only want to observe the exception case, you can just pass the value through. Um, the important thing about this is that you have this, these functions. Inval, uh, the, the arrow is a new ES6 thing where you have a fu you're declaring a function with an input on the left and, an, and it's, uh, the expression for its output on the right. In this case, the input value is the success value. The out response or out result which is the return value of either the value or error case is going to be the result that uh, gets forwarded to the output promise. So if you return a value from one of these handlers, it's going to give a value to your output promise. If you throw an error, it's going to propagate that error to your output promise. If you return a promise, it's going to wait to do further work and then it becomes that promise's uh, job to resolve the output promise. This makes them composable. And as opposed to, suppose just a plain old callback. With a pl plain old callback, you do not get any guarantees at all. It's up to your function to determine its interface and document it appropriately and behave well on your behalf. Um, so in this case, I've got this YOLO, you only live once, call a function and find out what happens function. Um, in this case, we have an I at the B, an, uh, an index or increment or number, integer, whatever, zero and we're going to increment it whenever YOLO decides to call our callback. It may do so before it returns. It may do so once before it returns, or never, or multiple times. And it may do any of those things in the future. Um, and if you, are if, you, if you want to make a plan, if you are creating a plan in your function and you want it to behave in a certain way, you need to have some guarantees about what that, uh, how YOLO is going to behave. Um, and in the absence of those guarantees, you can use promises to get them back because promises guarantee that, those ca that uh, the callbacks that, uh, that you give the promise are going to be called asynchronously. Promises give you order independence. How many people have dealt with the, uh, the, ready, the, uh, the, DOM, the DOM ready event, right? That you have to deal with two cases. There's the case where it already happened and you have to go monkey around looking for some property that tells you that it's already been done and the other case where you want to set up a callback and, and have it called in the future. In, uh, and with promises, you don't have to worry about that. You can observe either before or after. The result is going to be the same. They're order independent. So with promises, we get the possibility of async functions in the next version of the language. Async functions uh, introduce it are similar in spirit to the generator functions that I just introduced you to, except that they are purely for asynchronous values. They're not plural, they're singular. Uh, the way they work is that you uh, call, uh, you, you decorate your function with this async keyword, and you use await, very similar to yield. It has a tighter, a tighter precedence, so it makes it a little bit more fit for this use case. Um, so in this case, await binds to the, the result of get x and await binds to the result of get y and not to the aggregate, exp aggregate expression like yield would. Um, and the way this works is that await, the await key keyword receives a promise on the right-hand side and evaluates to the eventual value on the left-hand side. It pauses your function at the point where you, call it, where, where you use the await keyword waits for that result, and either throws or evaluates to the resulting value at that point in your program. So it's very, sim very similar to that continuation, uh, uh, the shallow continuation programming we have with generators, except we're pausing in response to asynchronous events through promises. And you can create asynchronous functions either uh, using uh, a transpiler today, uh, which, or you can use them uh, with generator functions and a decorator from a promise library. Q.async or uh, bluebird.promise.async are common ways to do this. Um, in this case, we're creating, we, are, we have a function that accepts a callback to do a job. That job is expected to return a promise, and when that promise is resolved, uh, is, is settled, I should say, 
we're going to track how much time it took to do that job and, and that is the result of the promise. In this case, we're, taking, uh, we're going to take the sum of the amount of time it took to do get x and get y and log that to the console. So recap of promises. Promises give you order independence. They guarantee asynchroneity, which is sometimes called containing Zalgo, the monster that wants to get out. Um, they're a defensive programming primitive. They allow you to have guarantees from w w when you're using callbacks. They're a principle of least authority or uh, uh, a POLA primitive, which allows one-way communication. You can give the promise to one person, the resolver to another. They're guaranteed to be able to communicate in exactly one way. Uh, they're composable. They're and interesting. They're uh, a gateway to using promises as proxies for remote objects because now you have this separation between time and space. The whole thing with JavaScript is that you can only deal with things in the memory of your program synchronously. If you want to do it, talk to anybody outside of your program, you must do so asynchronously. Now we have a, an asynchronous proxy for an object. Now we can talk to objects in other processes j in the same exact way that we talk to them in the same process as long as you're willing to do so asynchronously. Um, Promises came to me uh, through Mark Miller. There are a whole bunch of other precedents for promises if you look back. Um, but this is, this is the formulation that he put together for the e-programming language which we're inheriting in JavaScript. So what we can do now that we know about plurality and asynchrony is triangulate these two things and create streams. A stream is a plural asynchronous object. It has two sides. It has that dual. It has a producer and a consumer. In, er in order to make streams, I'm going to introduce you to another thing first. This is uh, an infinite promise queue. An infinite promise queue just has two methods, put and get. The thing about infinite promise queues is that unlike uh, with streams, we're going to want to have that conclusion thing where we can concatenate streams. An infinite promise queue is just an infinite promise queue or indefinite promise queue. You put things in, they come out. Unlike a synchronous or spatial queue, you can get things out of it before you put them in. It, you get that asynchronous order independence that's so important for having sanity when dealing with asynchronous programming. The, the guarantee is that if you call get, you're going to receive a promise for some respective value from the conceptual collection. When you call put, you're going to put the next value into the collection, that, and that value may be a promise, and the por corresponding puts uh, resolve the corresponding get. So the first get uh, resolve uh, the first put resolves the first get. The first the second put resolves the second get. So you can have your producer and consumer running at different paces, and and one can be producing and one can be consuming, and they can be blissfully in ignorant of what happened first for the other side. So I propose that you can use promise queues to transport iteration objects, those things with done and value properties that you have from iterators and generators. So in, in what we're going to do is we're going to create uh, an object, uh, we're going to create these promise queues and we're going to put iterations into them and obtain iterations out of them. Promise queues are deceptively simple. This is, or deceptive, they, they are succinct. This is the entire implementation of a promise queue given a promise library, um, or at least one variation on the theme. You just implement your get and put, and it is a, it's an asynchronous linked list. Don't think too hard about it. I was asked to reproduce this on an interview and failed. Um, I wouldn't recommend. But it is a, a great foundation for Promise, uh, for streams using promise queues. You create two promise queues. One of them is going to be, uh, is going to uh, transport values from the producer to the consumer. Another one is going to transport acknowledgments from the consumer to the producer. So now we have that tight relationship, the two-directional data flow between the producer and consumer. This enables us to do cancellation because the consumer is in just as good of a position to terminate the stream with an, ab uh, an aberrant case as the producer is. Um, and they're symmetric. Uh, amazingly, the dual of a reader is a writer, and the dual of a writer is a reader, and they're the same exact interface. You have an object that's very similar to an iterator. It has a next function, a return function, and a throw function, and the only difference is that they return promises for the things that an iterator would have returned synchronously. So the next function accepts a value which you're transporting back to your consumer and um, 
for transporting to your producer or uh, transporting to your producer or back to your consumer, either way. Um, and, it, and it returns a promise for an iteration, that object that has a value and a done. And when you have this concept, it becomes possible to understand what it means to combine generators and the async functions. We can have async generator functions. And they use both yield and await, but they use them for different purposes. Await is for pausing the progress and, uh, and awaiting upon some value, and yield is for producing values. This function returns a stream. You call it, uh, you can give it a stream, as I do in this case, or, or some other parameters, and in this, this stream is going to uh, is going to loop until one of the uh, until the input stream is consumed, and then produce the sum of each sub e each pair of values from the consumer. So it'll take one, it'll take another, sum them, and send that off to the producer. Take one, take the other, sum them, send them to the producer. And importantly, it has that pressure feature. The uh, the the consumer is going to take promises as fast as it can consume them, and the producer side is going to full uh, is going to resolve them at the pace that the consumer dictates. And that is the full matrix, space and time, asynchronous and synchronous, plural and singular. So I'm going to show you a few animations to illustrate how streams work. This is based off of a prototype I hacked together for the paper that this presentation is based on, by no means complete. Um, but it works well enough and works inside of a browser well enough that I can create these animations for you. Um, this is the first example. We're going to have a shared stream, multiple consumers, a single stream. Um, so in this case, I have a range of value. I'm going to promote an iteration, a synchronous construct, into an asynchronous plural, in indefinite asynchronous stream. Um, the values from 0 to 100 are going to go into this stream at the rate that they're consumed. I'm going to map each value uh, to uh, the same value, except that I'm going to introduce a 250 millisecond delay. Um, and I added some fuzz to that, so it's approximately 250 mil milliseconds in the, pr uh, in the visualization. And I'm going to then consume this source stream with multiple, uh, with three, uh, with three consumers that are going to wait approximately a second um, before uh, between consuming each value. And you'll note that it's one input stream, multiple consumers. What e so each of those consumers is going to see different values from the producer. It's going, uh, they're going to be non-overlapping regions of the thing. And the interesting thing about this, pr uh, the interesting property of this method is that uh, the rate at which the source is consumed is the sum of the rates at which the, uh, the consumers can take the values. As opposed to forking a stream, where you want all of the consumers to observe every value in order from the producer. So this is a very similar concept. We are creating, um, we're creating a stream from an array of 100, we're introducing some delay, and then we're forking it into three streams. And for each of one of those, we're going to consume them at a different rate. Um, the code doesn't correspond exactly. But um, A, B, and C each have a different uh, rate of consumption from the source. You'll note that the source is being consumed at the rate of the slowest consumer. This is, this is where back pressure becomes handy. Not the con not, none of the... The, the producer is not permitted to, to move any faster than the slowest consumer, allowing all of the consumers to see every value. And that is the trade-off you're making. Do you want, uh, how are you going to respond to this case? This is expensive, that you're going to proceed slowly. Uh, you're, going to sp uh, you're going to proceed at the, at, the ca at the speed of the worst case for your consumers, whereas if you went the other road and, and managed to find a way to partition the, the stream in a way that it doesn't matter which stream gets which value, you can, you can move faster. Um, this is a sequence of maps. Uh, you'll notice that uh, unlike arrays, the, the, each of these methods on a, on a stream has a last, an additional argument that you can pass in. You've got your callback, your, uh, your context pointer, and this is your uh, parallelism limit, your, uh, the number of jobs that it will do in parallel at any given time. This allows you to, pr to do an infinite amount of work one piece at a time and to, uh, to consume 
at the, at the pace that your jobs are actually doing their work. So what map is going to do is it's going to create a job for every value from the stream, and it's only going to have 32 outstanding promises at a given time. And the next step is only going to do 16 at a time. The next one's going to do one, four. And then the last one's going to be serial. It's going to do one at a time. And that is your bottleneck. We're going to proceed at the pace, eventually proceed at the pace of, uh, of the last stage of the stream. So you'll note that the map 32 took 32 values off of the source immediately. And then six, the map 16 took 16 off of the 32 immediately. But um, eventually, we're just going to have 32 jobs with results waiting to be consumed by the next stage. And each stage is being filtered down into the last map. And so it's, that's your bottleneck. And then you, the entire system moves at the pace of the map 1. You can use reducers. Uh, reducers on, reduce on array is awesome. Reducers on streams is even more awesome. You can limit the amount of work. Uh, do a whole bunch of things asynchronously, um, and you can limit that amount of work. So this reducer is going to find the maximum of the values from the input, and it's going to do that by doing a job that takes a random amount of time and then return the maximum of the two values and log the result. The way I've done this is that, uh, the way I've done this simulation is that each of the values from the, each, fr each of the values from the candidate stream, or from the source stream, is getting promoted into the candidate's pool. And then each candidate is being moved into a job where it's either the left side A or the right side B of this max operation that's going to take some time. And when it's done, it's going to discard the, the lower value and put it in the not max pile. And the other value is going to return to the candidate pool. And then the reducer just takes, opportunistically does some number of jobs at a, at a time, taking whatever values are on the candidate pool. Um, and you'll notice that, like, for example, 99 is still a candidate, is being, com uh, is being compared against new values. And eventually, it'll have to be compared against values that have been laying around for a while, uh, 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 compared against candidates that you've already seen and compared against multiple others. So you got, we got 99, 98, and 97 are in the running. 96 is still, no, just got discarded. Um, and then at the end, the last one's death match, and 99 is the win. <laughs> and then you can, you can compose these things. Map, you can be, uh, map and reduce. Uh, you've heard of them before. Here they are in JavaScript in a single event loop using, uh, using streams. The map is taking values. Uh, it's transforming them, or in this case, just adding some delay. And then the, the same maximum operation occurs. And I won't belabor you with watching the entire thing again, but um, we just added this additional stage, which is the map, which is producing values that the reducer is consuming. And that is a general theory of reactivity. And I'm hoping that this is the way that the language goes and that you'll, you guys will be able to use this around the corner. Um, I'm an engineer at Uber. We're hiring in San Francisco. I'm working on a network overlay that is very interesting. We have all sorts of projects in geospatial indexing and we have no limit of problems that, of interesting problems that if you're interested in them. And come talk to me later and I'll tell you all about them. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm prepared to take questions. I guess I have another, uh, I'll give it another 10 minutes and then yield the room. Yes, if you go to the uh, search for GTOR, you'll find, uh, you'll find a GitHub repository which has the long form of this presentation. Uh, it's a unwieldy and un I wouldn't expect you to read all of it. <laughs> but you've gotten a good summary of this, uh, some of summary of it here, but it also includes sample implementations of some of these primitives, uh, including a task primitive which uh, is like a promise, but it's cancelable and has this other feature where once it's observed, it can, only be, it can never be observed again, which has implications for garbage collection and distributed system, among other things. So for promises, it makes sense to have them in the language because the, uh, because it, uh, the, the inspection tools for promises are getting better. Is you can see you can see promises outstanding. You can have another panel in your inspector that says these promises are still pending and these promises have been rejected but unhandled so far. Um, 
and, and can pr give you some asynchronous insight. And if you're doing promises for remote objects, you can have a distributed debugger that tells you about all the promises in all of your processes that are outstanding and what one, which one, what you can piece back your history asynchronously following cause and effect through these resolution chains. Uh, that doesn't exist yet. There was a thing called Causeway that did that. So it makes sense to have promises, at least, in the language. Um, it definitely makes sense to have them in the language in order to support the syntactic feature of asynchronous generator functions um, because it, there is no reasonable return value for an asynchronous generator function until a stream is introduced to the language. Um, and apart from that, you can still, like promises, we've been able to use promises for at least four years in JavaScript um, and it works. <laughs> Um, not inherently, but as, as I mentioned earlier, if you, if you have a program that is broken up into multiple asynchronous workers communicating with each other through message passing, uh, you can, for example, use promises as proxies to those other objects and other processes. Uh, I have a prototype of that idea with a project called Q Connection, um, which uses Q promises to do other interesting things of promise pipelining through message passing. Uh, Q promises have a few additional methods to, that you don't have on standard promises. It has an invoke method and a get method, each of which return promises and send messages to the underlying handler. And in, a, in the single process world, that makes a lot of sense because you can have a fulfilled handler and a pending handler and a rejected handler and they behave in different ways. And that just is a nice implementation detail that comes at a performance cost. Um, but you can introduce another kind of handler for remote objects that take those same exact messages, those invoke messages, those get messages, those when messages, and sends them off to a remote process and gives you a local, uh, gives you a promise for the result locally, intermediately, that you can pipeline additional requests on. Yeah, well, the, the async function is, the, the language guarantees that it will return a promise, regardless of what you do, and that promise will be rejected with whatever error is thrown within the async await. And as Mark was mentioning in the last talk, uh, those exceptions can be caught with the same exact um, try-catch uh, syntax within an async await, which makes them, uh, make, will make promises more bearable, uh, primitive for, for going forward. Oh, one more? Yes. No, that, I was thinking about that earlier today. Async and uh, the yield and await are necessarily different because it is a perfectly reasonable thing to do to yield promises before they're, f before they're resolved and, you, and basically use your, use your asynchronous generator function as a transport mechanism for these promises without actually waiting for their results. Um, not sure what you would do that for yet, but wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to. Con to con I wouldn't want to get rid of the possibility. Go ahead. So the impetus. One of the big reasons for me writing this talk was because there was a question on ES Discuss about what even would be an asynchronous generator function, and the big question was: Do you wrap the value, or do you wrap the iteration for the value, with uh, with the promise? Um, thinking it through, I'm pretty sure that the right answer is give a promise for the iteration and allow the value to be whatever. So uh, when you yield, you are, your yield is resolving the promise for the next iteration and it just takes the value that you yielded and puts it in the value slot of the iteration object and passes that through. Whatever it is, you could yield away if you if you cared all right well thank you for coming um, I'm the guy with the pointy hat you can it uh, to, to makes me easy to find if you have additional questions afterward um, and I pleasure uh, it's been my pleasure to talk to you <laughs>